morning and welcome to Columbia. We are so honored you are worshiping with us this morning. I hope you had a fantastic new year. Before we worship, if you're new to Columbia, would you let us know who you are? You can fill out a Connect card at columbiabaptist.org connect. And when you do, $25 will be donated to our Spend Yourself Food Pantry in your honor. Also, before we get started this morning, why don't you share this service with someone you know? You can hit the share button on Facebook or YouTube and post it so your friends can check out your church. And now, it's time to head into worship. So make sure you stretch, get your coffee, and let's worship our God together today. Good morning and welcome to Columbia. Please stand wherever you are and join us as we declare, I am who you say I am. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me and know oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free.
Amen, amen. I pray that you just know that as children of God, that is God's desire to bless you. And so we want to share a poem with you and uh, some kids to read it to you. So check this out. People say bless you when you sneeze. Bless has turned into a bit of a feeble word. But in the Bible, it's much stronger and has nothing to do with sneezing. When God promises to bless you, he is saying, I'm going to make you into everything I ever meant for you to be. It means God is taking every day and every single thing that happens in it, good or bad, to make you stronger, to mend whatever is broken inside, to change you into the person you were always meant to be. Just as a caterpillar is totally changed into a butterfly, being blessed means being totally transformed. God is transforming everything, his broken world, and you. God is transforming everything, his broken wor world, and you. God is transforming everything, his broken world, and you.
you, Lord. You are the way maker. That is who you are. And because of who you are, we praise you. And so let's just continue to worship him as we sing this song we taught you last fall called Be Praised.
And all the storms of soul you call in my defense, my only song is hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh. And how he never let me go. Now what to him who is able? Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And let there never be a day that I don't rise to bring you praise. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Be praised. Be praised. Be praised. Be praised. Be praised. Be praised. We worship you. Be praised. Be praised. Forever. Forever. And always. Woo. Amen. God, would you be praised? May we remember who you are. May we remember what you've done, that you're the God who created, who sustains, who gives life, hope, purpose, love, joy, and salvation. God, we worship because we know you are God and we know you are good. So Holy Spirit, move amongst us as we worship this morning, in our homes and in this sanctuary. Speak loudly. Convict. Call us out. Call us up. Teach us. Transform us. Let us not walk away from this time unchanged by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray and we believe. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray and all God's people everywhere said, amen, 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 amen. Thank you for those of you who are in the sanctuary this morning. We love you. You may be seated. And we're about to move into a time of worship through giving. And if you're a guest at Columbia, you know, uh, feel no pressure to give. For those who call Columbia home, you know this is an opportunity for you to give to the good work that you see God doing through Columbia and Northern Virginia and throughout the world. And so you can do that. And as you do that, I want to share a song with you some Columbians put together a couple months ago. As we start this new year, I don't know about you, but I'm praying for peace. Peace in my own heart, my own mind, peace in our country, peace in our world. And so this song's called Lord Give Us Peace. So check it out. With your spirit, with me dwell. 
Have you ever been faced with a challenge that when you're in the middle of it, you didn't know exactly how it was going to turn out and if it was going to be good? Well, if you have, you are in great company. I mean, think about Abraham and Noah and Joseph and Moses and Paul and even Jesus. If you've lived on this planet for more than five minutes, you have encountered a challenge in your life. I'm sure of it. You've, you've experienced a sudden career redirection, or you've been called by your employer to move from this town that you love and this neighborhood that you love to go to this other place that you don't know anything about. Or perhaps you've studied hard and you've worked towards a grade just to find out that it wasn't what you had hoped. Or maybe you had worked so hard to be chosen for a particular team and that you didn't actually get picked to be on that team. We all face challenges in our lives, and for me, I remember this one particular challenge that I was faced with during seminary. I entered seminary as a, in mid-career, in, in my midlife, and I had a, a family, a three children, I was married, I was working at a church, and somehow going to seminary seemed like a good idea. I don't know. So, so after my first semester, I looked down at my grade report card and, and I saw that I had completed two classes and I saw four credits. And each class was worth two credits, four credits, and I looked ahead and I said, and saw that there was going to be 90 required. And I was overwhelmed. But I persevered through and, and most of the classes were challenging. I'll, I'll just admit all of them were challenging. It wasn't Sunday school anymore here. and so. Entering into eight long years of study. And as I neared the end of it, I, one of the classes that I was taking, you'll be happy to know, was preaching. And so in my preaching class, uh, we were coming, uh, the whole challenge of, of the course was each week we met for two hours. And the professor was walking us through the scenarios of, of how to preach and how to prepare and how to deliver. And so every week he built upon that, and the ultimate goal was to deliver a sermon at the end of the, the semester. But as was his habit each week, we'd have a break in the middle of the two hours, and as we were preparing to leave for the 10-minute break, he would give us an assignment, and he would say, when you come back, each of you will have two minutes to talk about this, and he'd give us a topic. And so this topic, uh, one of my favorite ones was when he said, you have to come back, all the class, come back and talk to uh, the class on how to do something. And we got to pick what our do something was. 
And so I walked out of the class, and it was always daunting to, in 10 minutes, quickly write a two-minute talk or think through a two-minute talk and then come back and deliver it. But so I thought, well, what, what can I do, a how-to? Like, this would be, um, you know, what, what do I do? Like, what's good? I could bake a cake. I know how to bake a cake. Oh, I was a mom of, a, of teenagers at the time, and I thought, what am I really good at? I'm good at annoying my kids. So I wrote a two-minute talk on how to annoy your kids, so that was a lot of fun. But one of the toughest ones was the day that he, we were preparing for the break, as usual, and it was near the end of the semester, and we were almost there in the home stretch, and graduation for me was on the horizon. And as we were preparing to leave, he said, all right, the assignment when you come back from break is, is that each one of you will get in front of the class and sing Happy Birthday. Now, I don't know if you know me very well, but I don't sing. I don't, I don't sing very well. In fact, it, that doesn't even qualify. I'm awful at singing. And if you're ever near me in the front of the sanctuary, you know, nah. And so that day, as I walked out in total disbelief and in sheer panic of how was I ever going to get out of this because there was no way I was coming back to sing Happy Birthday all by myself in front of this entire class. And so as I walked out, I went off alone, just overwhelmed, and I was contemplating, like, what could I do to get out of this task? And so I thought, well, maybe I'll check in with myself. Maybe I'm not feeling very well. I could just say I'd really like to do this, but I'm feeling pretty sick and I need to go home. And, but I wasn't actually feeling sick. So, so there I kept thinking, thinking, thinking. I said, that's it. I'm quitting. I'm quitting seminary because there's no way I'm going back in there to, to do this. Like, there's no way he can't make me do this. Well, all to say, I did go back in, I did sing, and I did graduate. And so I thought, today, what I would do is I would sing you happy birthday in lieu of a sermon, and then we'll all just go to lunch. <laughs> ha, not on your life. <laughs> I would like to thank Dr. Jim for the invitation to speak to you today. Uh, Dr. Jim is off having a, a Sunday of, of rest and recovery that's well-deserved, and I hope, Jim, that you're home watching in your slippers uh, this morning. But as we ring in the new year, many of us are glad that 2020 is in the rearview mirror. And there's been just a, a challenging year that has been marked by a measurable loss, a global pandemic, social injustice, political unrest, and our lives have been forever changed. And this has happened without warning and without any sort of uh, end in the foreseeable future. So we're left to ask, can God rescue us from our problems? And so the prophet Isaiah says with a resounding yes, yes, and he gives us a vision in his book of the loving greatness and the holiness of a God who is calling us back. He's calling us to return, to repent and be renewed because the Messiah has come, as we just celebrated a couple weeks ago. And this changes everything. The prophet Isaiah is God's prophet uh, to the nation of Judah. In the 8th century, Isaiah is called as the first prophet and is known as perhaps the greatest of all the prophets. And so he is speaking to the nation of Judah in the divided kingdom of the northern and the southern kingdom. And he's God's spokesperson to this nation, calling the people back to himself. And he's telling the people that if you do not return and repent, that you are facing uh, God's judgment. The book of Isaiah can be considered a Bible in miniature. And what we see, what Isaiah does, is he lays out God's whole meta narrative in his book. He's talking from Genesis to Revelation. And at that time, he's prophesizing what the future will be like when the Messiah comes and then when ultimately uh, Jesus returns the second time. And so, what we see in Isaiah is, a, is the prophet. Uh, communicating to the, to the uh, nation of, of Israel or uh, Judah, and he's calling them back to themselves. And what we know about Isaiah is that Isaiah was quoted more times in the New Testament than any other Old Testament uh, uh, book. And so the disciples quoted Isaiah, 
Jesus quoted Isaiah. And what we find is, is that the same God that was this, in this book of Isaiah, the same God who is in creation and the same God that is in Revelation is the same God that was the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so uh, Isaiah is, is called to warn the people of Judah to come back. And you see, the funny thing is, is about what was happening here is Isaiah was preaching to very religious people. They said their prayers, they, they brought their offerings to Jerusalem, they, they fasted, but stubbornly these people were willing to, to follow and listen and trust in just about anyone and anything other than the one true living God who they couldn't control. So refusing to submit themselves to the one true living God, uh, they found themselves estranged from God and separated. And what they were facing because of this uh, this refusal to follow and obey and listen to God was, was the upcoming uh, exile and captivity in Assyria and eventually into to Babylon. But here in Isaiah, at the end of the book of Isaiah, the last 27 chapters, God is speaking to, through Isaiah, to the people, and he's promising, he's making a promise. He says, I know that this is what's happening. I know that you are not able and you are not going to, and you are going to reap the, the punishment, the judgment of not following. You are going into exile. But he says, I want to bring you hope. He says, God is promising that he's going to graciously uh, return his people back, that he's going to save a remnant, a remnant that will, will bring honor and glory to God's name, and, he will, and the remnant will demonstrate that God is the one true living God, that he is the, uh, the one to follow. And in the book of Isaiah, that while he's talking to the people here and now, he's talking also about a future point in time. And he's talking about that uh, to remind the people, it's like to have hope, like not to give up. He's saying the Messiah is coming, the long-awaited one. And we read that every year at Christmas in Isaiah chapter 9. And he wants to tell the people, don't give up, hope is on the way. And so God's faithfulness, and he brings the, the kingdom back, and he brings the people back. And what he's saying is, is that I'm going to be preparing, I am creating a new kingdom, a new kingdom where Jesus is the ruler, where love is the power of the day, where sin and oppression and injustice are no more. And the coming of the Messiah changes everything. So let's take a look at the promised new kingdom in Isaiah 65. Uh, we're going to start with verse 17. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever, and in what I will create. For I will create Jer Jerusalem to be a delight, and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again where there'll be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be merely a youth. He, he who falls to, fails to reach a hundred will be considered accused. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. They will, no, they will not toil in vain or, or bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, and they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the oxen. The dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all of my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but one of my favorite days is New Year's Day. And what I love about New Year's Day is, is, is that it's that moment between the, what has happened in the past and what is in the future. And so it's a day where I usually like to sit with my calendar and my Bible, and I just like to sit 
with a pad of paper, and I like to sit and think about and reflect on all the things that have happened in the year before. And I like to sit there in that moment, and I like to dream and create and vision what will happen in the coming year. I like to think about uh, what kind of, of challenges will I have for myself? Will I start a new fitness program? Uh, will I recommit to healthy uh, eating and, and lifestyles again? I, I think about the ministry goals that we have talked about and prepared for, and I just think about it as a chance to just renew all that is happening in my life. And Isaiah paints a beautiful picture of the vision that God has given uh, to him for what the new heavens and what the new earth is going to look like. And he says the same vision that, that the Apostle John talks about in Revelation 21 and 2 Peter in 3.13. It's this vision describing something that we can't even comprehend in our lives. I don't know about you, but when, when God is talking about the former things that have happened will not be remembered, like, that's hard to, hard to fathom. Like, he's saying that this future this new kingdom that I am bringing about, this new heavens and this new earth is going to be something so great and so amazing that you can't even hardly comprehend it, much less I need you to know that like, you're going to be so focused on that and so overwhelmed with its beauty that the things that happened in the former are not even going to be a memory for you. I, wouldn't that be amazing? The former things of, of sin and, and destruction and death and weeping, and crying, and loss, and pandemics, like that, we won't even think about this, this thing that like overwhelms our news feeds, and overwhelms our lives, and we don't know, do we do this, do we do that, do we do this, what, what, we're, like, like that is gone, I don't know about you, but it's really hard to forget, it's hard to forget these things, like sometimes I think about, maybe I should go work on a doctorate, and then I remember how hard seminary was, and I was like, nope, but God is creating and he's restoring and he's renewing creation back to the way it was. And the creator God in Genesis is revealing to the people of Judah that he's still working on their behalf. And his creative nature, he's, he's creating this new heavens and this new, this new earth. And so what we know is that God is always creating. In Genesis 1.1, we know that God created. He tells us that uh, he formed out of nothing. He created this whole world, this universe. We don't even know how expansive it is. But what we know is, is that he formed us and he created us with a plan and a purpose. But the plan went south quickly after a couple chapters. But we're reminded in Isaiah that God is, is creating. He's continuing to create. In Isaiah 43, 19, he talks about, he says, do you not see? Do you not see that I am creating? I'm making streams in the desert. I'm making a way in the desert, streams for you. And he starts out in Isaiah 65, and he says, see, or behold, or look. And what that means is pay attention. Do you not see in all your hurrying, your scuttle and bubble, you're going from here to there, whatever? Are you not noticing what I'm doing in this world? I am creating. I'm continuing to create. I'm creating a way for you. And he promises in 65, I will create. And we stand in that tension and in that moment that he's working. He's working um, throughout history on our behalf. It's this big meta-narrative that's going on in the upper story of Scripture, that when we read from Genesis to Revelation, what God is doing in the cosmos, in the divine. He's threading throughout all of Scripture. The story of Jesus, the Messiah, is coming. Help is on the way. And that he will come again. And down here in the lower story, we see the everyday comings and goings of the lives of people in Scripture like Abraham and Noah and Joseph and Paul and Peter. And we see what happens when Jesus comes. And you know what? The story continues in your life and in my life. God never wastes a crisis to bring people to himself. It may be a crisis of belief where God is has, is making a calling on your life, or maybe God has initiated a challenge in your life. 
Maybe it's something of a natural disaster or a natural cause or, or maybe it's by will of man and woman, our will that has caused a challenge or a crisis. Because we live in a fallen and a broken world, no matter the source, God can use every bit of history for our good and for his glory. 1978 will go down in, in history for the, for the Washington Bullets. I don't know, some of you weren't even born then. <laughs> but in 1978, Coach Dick Mata was, was the coach of the Washington Bullets. They were in their fifth year of being in Washington, D.C., and, and he was known for being a strict disciplinarian and had a high expectation for his players. And as a result, he produced tremendous teams of of players, very skilled. He had people like Wes Unsell and, and um, Alvin Hayes and Charles Johnson who were part of his team. He had an all-star cast. But somehow in 1978, the Bullets were struggling. They barely had a record above 500, and so by some miraculous way against all odds and all predictions, they had made it into the NBA playoffs to play Seattle Supersonics. And so after the beginning of the series, the, the, the seven-game series, that went back and forth, a win, or a loss, a win, a loss. But really, the reality was is no one thought that the Bullets could ever, ever pull this off. And so Coach Modest, in his inspirational talks, was overheard to say to the team, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. And what he was saying to the team is, is that we may be behind, but it's not over until all the games are played. And so, lo and behold, they get to game seven, and somehow the bullets pull it off. Now, Wes Unsell would say that it was actually Charles Johnson who made it happen. You see, at just the right time, the team acquired Charles Johnson going into the series. And Charles Johnson brought a whole new level of play to the court and to the team. And they won the series. No one expected that. And so you see, just as it is with God, at just the right time, he sent Jesus. And when Jesus came, God said, it ain't over till it's over, until all the games are played. And when Jesus came, it changed everything. It changed the whole game. It changed the whole future. It changed the whole vision of what was going to happen. And so when Jesus came, he brought in and ushered in the new order. And so the old order of sin and death and destruction that had happened, where people were struggling to know, was God even hearing my prayers? Is this ever going to change? Is, there, is God still there? Is he still for us? Is he still with us? And so in comes Jesus. And in comes the new order. And in this new order, there's life, and there's resurrection, and there's redemption, and there's renewal. And so here we stand in this place of the now and the not yet, where Jesus has, in fact, come, we know. And Jesus will come again at some point in the future, but we're kind of in this in-between place, the now and the not yet. And so what do we do? Do we wait? Sometimes we have a an idea that we're going to sit, our salvation was for, for some, you know, future point. Like, well, one day we'll go to heaven. Now, I don't have a lot of time to unpack this, but I invite you all to be part of a small group who's going to dive deep into what, what does our salvation really mean? And what is it meant for? For now? Or we talk about it in the future. But Jesus said the Messiah has come, and in that new order, he ushers in this new kingdom. And we see when he teaches the uh, disciples how to pray in Matthew 6, when he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I mindlessly repeat that prayer. But there's something really important for us not to miss here. Is that in this new order... We were not saved for some future place that we're going to go to and for some future purpose. We were, our salvation and is meant for here and now. So our job, our task is to bring heaven on earth 
right now. Now, many of you know the Gravits, we like to play sports. And if you're one of the kids in our family, at some point in your life, you were given the gift of a basketball. And every single one of our kids played basketball at some point in their life on a team. And when this gift was given to one of our kids at any given time, it, w it wasn't given as just something that was a personal use. We didn't say here, Brittany or Christian or Brett, here's a basketball. It's your basketball. You only use the basketball. It's not for anyone else's use. It's your, your use. Now, that would be ridiculous because that would, that would not even matter to, like, that's not even what the purpose of a basketball is. The purpose of a basketball is to be played in a game with a team, not to go off in a corner and to be shared only by the child or the player. And, you know, that's what it is for us. We've been given a gift in our salvation. And it's not for our personal use. It's for our good and for God's glory. It's so that we can bring heaven on earth. And so here we are, we, we stand right here and understand that we were created for both time and eternity, for now and in the future, that we have a job, we have a purpose to do, that you were created, as Ephesians 8, uh, 2, 8 and 10 says, that for by grace you have been saved. It's not of your own works, but, but that God has saved you. You are God's workmanship, it says in 2 Corinthians. So when God called Abraham and, and Joseph and Noah and Moses and Paul, and when he, when he called Abraham out of his home, his father's home place, and he said, go to a place that I tell you, and I will bless you. He didn't do that for, for Abraham. He did that for all the nations. He, did, he blessed Noah so that he could then be a blessing to all the nations, that he could bring the blessing to everyone else. When, when God saved Joseph out of the well and sent him into uh, Potiphar's house, he didn't save Joseph just because he thought Joseph was great or his, Joseph was his favorite or jo poor Joseph. He saved Joseph for a purpose, not for his own personal use. When God rescued Moses out of that basket as a little baby and when he grew him up in the Egyptian palace and when he sent him the burning bush and then he sent him back to the to Pharaoh, and he said, let my people go. He didn't save Moses out of that basket for Moses' sake because Moses was a cute baby. He saved him for a purpose, and he saved you, and he saved me for a purpose. The idea is, is that we're to bring hope. In this new order, we have a job to do, and we have to decide when we stand at the start of the new year, 2021, and we look to all the things that have been in the past, how horrible, how challenging being in a global pandemic is. Okay, it's hard, no doubt. There's a lot of crummy parts about this, a lot. But God is telling us, hope is on the way. And you are it. As someone that has Jesus dwelling in your heart and in your life, every room and every space that you go into, you walk into that space and you bring the hope of Jesus Christ into that room. And so you have a decision to make, and so do I. As we stand at this moment, what do you need to take into the new year with you? And what do you need to leave behind? See, when God called Abraham, he had to leave behind his country and his father's house. When Joseph, he took, Joseph, Joseph took with him all his dreams that God had given with him. And Noah, he took all the animals onto the ark with him. And Moses, he left behind social injustice and oppression. And Paul took into his new life his zeal and passion for the Lord. 
And Jesus, he left behind death and he brought forward life. It's for our good and for God's glory that you have been saved and you've been called for a purpose. God has given us a vision and of, of a renewal of a new heaven and a new earth and a new kingdom that is coming forth. So for me, I plan to live in my house. I plan to live in my house as if it's in the new kingdom as I walk forward. See, we've been given a gift of our homes and our communities. And so how about if we start living in them as if the new kingdom has come? That we start treating our own homes as places where the new kingdom, the new order resides. And for some of us, that's a challenging place. And you may need help with that. And so I invite you to get help. But some of us, we need to start living in our neighborhoods as if the kingdom is here so that other people around us will know that God has come and is coming again. I plan to live with the work of my hands and to use the work of my hands not as something I have to do, but something I get to do. And so sometimes we need to just change the focus and the dial a little bit that, that helps us to understand that this thing this work, we can focus on the toil and the heart and the, and the challenge of our work, or we can say, look at what God has given me to do. And not just because I'm a pastor, it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, a lawyer, you're a teacher, you're an engineer, you work at the public schools or the private schools, you work in our child development center, look at the work of our hands. Like, can we bring the work of our hands into this new order here and now? Can we bring heaven to earth? And what kind of difference would that make for all my coworkers when I bring heaven to earth into the work of my hands? And the same for you. And what I hope to do is that I hope that every space that I bring in, walk into this year, that I bring in the love of Jesus Christ, that I bring in peace and harmony and justice. So what do you need to do? That's your homework. But as you go, I want you to know that you're a hope bringer. God has put a mission in your hands, like a gift of a basketball. And he has given you this mission and this work and this purpose that is far greater than all the stuff in the lower story. But he uses the stuff in the lower story to proclaim his purpose. So he's inviting you to use your work of your hands, of your home and your community to usher in and bring the new heaven and the new earth until Jesus comes again. And so just as as you go, I want you to remember that today Jesus changes everything. Let's pray. Father God, as we stand at the beginning of a brand new year, 2021, and we think back to all the things that have happened in the past, it's been a challenging year, and you have challenged us to return, to repent, and be renewed by the knowledge that Jesus has already come. He has come and he will come again. That you are inviting us into a new order and that you have gifted us with a mission and a purpose to be your hope bringers. So God, I pray for everyone in the hearing of my voice that they will hear your love, that you have given us the gift of grace and salvation in Jesus Christ. God, may that fill our hearts and our homes as we walk forward into this new year. May we bring honor and glory to your name alone. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now take a look at a couple of announcements before you go. 
as you prepare to go ignite passion for Jesus Christ from Metro Washington to the world, I have a few things I want to share with you. First, if you are a part of Columbia, make sure you join us next Sunday as Dr. Jim will be doing a one-week sermon on Columbia's vision for 2021. Plan to be there and be in prayer about what God is up to next at Columbia. Lastly, we have some awesome guys who want to share our next announcement. I'm really sad we have to put our Christmas decorations away. Yeah, me too. Oh, but you know what? This snowman here reminds me of a funny joke. You want to hear it? Yeah. Great. What did one snowman say to the other snowman? Hmm, I don't know. It smells like carrots in here. <laughs> Hi, Columbia. I'm Mr. Andrew, one of the preschool ministry volunteers, and I'm here with my special helper. And while he and I are putting away our Christmas decorations and telling jokes, we seriously hope to see you at the next Adventure Pack Party. On Saturday, January 9th. From 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. in the parking lot. Oh, and we'll be joined by the one and only Spider-Man and two very well-known Disney princesses. Who are the princesses? Well, I'll sing you a hint. <clears throat> well, now they know, let it go, let it go, can't hold it back anymore. Okay, okay, sorry I asked. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll stop. But you all make sure you go to ColumbiaBaptist.org slash kids online to get all the information about this fun event and to register. See you there. Also on January 9th, we will be having a drive and drop for our food pantry. So if you are coming to the Adventure Pack Party, please consider bringing food for the pantry when you come. And if you are not coming for the party, please come to drop off food. These drop-offs have significantly helped us keep our shelves stocked. This month, we are looking for items such as hearty canned soup, box crackers, and canned meat. Go to columbiabaptist.org slash list to get all of the details and to get the full list of items we are hoping to collect. Thank you for being with us today. Again, if you are new to Columbia, please go to columbiabaptist.org slash connect and let us know who you are. We would love to get you connected and send you a welcome gift. Now, as whole life disciples, love and be light in the name of Jesus. Have an amazing day and we will see you back here next week. Each week when we talk about and we stay together to go and ignite passion for Jesus Christ from Metro Washington to the world, what we're saying is, is that we are to go and to bring heaven on earth in our daily walk. And so you do just that. Go and ignite passion for Jesus Christ from Metro Washington to the world. Be a hope bringer. We love you. We'll see you back next week for Jim's vision sermon. I can't wait to hear what he has for us. Have a blessed week.